I previously claimed that although genetics affects the risk of MS, it does not affect the severity of MS, but a new study has refuted me. This new genome-wide association study reports the first ever multiple sclerosis severity gene, a gene associated with worse prognosis in MS. But what is this gene? What does it do? And how strong is this association? And what can we learn about MS? And what about other genes? that may have an association as well. And to give a little background, it's very well known that the risk of MS is to some extent genetic. This is a table I compiled from various sources of the risk of MS in family members with the disease. For identical twins, if one has MS, the risk is around 25%. For fraternal twins, only 2 to 5%. For a first degree relative that is female, such as a daughter or sister, the risk is around 3%. For a son or brother, around 1% for a second degree relative, such as a niece or nephew, the risk is around 1%. And for distant relatives, it's only slightly higher than the general population. The most famous multiple sclerosis gene is HLA-DRB1-1501, which codes for part of the major histocompatibility complex type 2 involved in how the immune system reacts with foreign antigens. If you have two copies of this allele, you have an eightfold increased risk of MS. And you can see various studies showing that the gene is is much more common in people with MS than the general population, no matter where you look in the world. However, this same gene, although it increases the risk of MS, does not seem to be associated with prognosis. This is a study looking at people who had EDSS less than four, EDSS or expanded disability status scale, is a measure of disability used in multiple sclerosis research. Less than four is fairly low, but what proportion progressed to greater than four in this study? study over 14 years, whether or not you had the gene or not, your risk was approximately the same. Hence, this is a gene that affects multiple sclerosis risk, but not multiple sclerosis severity. And the same holds true for various other genes associated with MS. But Dr. Sergio Barancini and his colleagues discovered something completely new. And I want to give credit to Dr. Barancini for this incredible study and for personally emailing me the full text, which I had difficulty finding. This is a genome-wide association study of 12,584 people with MS, a huge sample size in 21 centers in North America, Europe, and Australia. And they focused on people with MS of European ancestry, which was unfortunate and limits the applicability of the data to other ethnicities. But that's really the only way they were able to get a huge sample size. They do have a comment on a few other ethnicities, which I'll mention later. The mean age was 51. 1.7 and the mean disease duration was 18.2 years and they did a multivariate analysis adjusting for various factors including age, sex, date of birth, and center, all of which can be correlated with disability. Now there have been GWAS studies before but they only had limited information like diagnosis of multiple sclerosis so you could see if genes linked to getting MS but they actually had data on disability which is obviously critical to this study. And the key finding was the RS1019132 allele and the DYSF ZNF638 locus linked to worse multiple sclerosis. Specifically, if you looked at median time to EDSS6, the time it takes to acquire significant enough disability where you need a cane to walk 100 meters, it was shortened by 3.7 years on average if you had two copies of this allele compared to none. They also showed people with this genotype had more disease in the brainstem and cortex. Now we'll get into that allele in a moment, but first I wanna show you how exceptional this finding is. You are looking at all of the genes that they studied and the different chromosomes, chromosome one, two, three, four, et cetera, all the way up to 22. And you may be surprised to see such low p-values. The thing about studying a large number of variables is just by random chance, you're gonna have some outliers and they have a way to correct for this statistically when they're looking at a large number of analyses. And here you can see a log scale of the p-value and the markers for statistical 
physical significance. So this higher marker, the dashed line, means genome-wide association significance. It's a very clear significance, and you can see our allele of interest here, which we'll take a look at in the moment. But in between the dashed line and the dotted line, it's not 100% clear, but there's a suggestive association. Maybe it has a very small association, small effect size, not quite clear statistical significance. So the point is there are other genes that may link a little bit with MS severity. If we focus in on just chromosome 2, again, you can see this huge outlier. One thing I want to note is they didn't just look at the EDSS. They actually adjusted it for age. It turns out that people who are older with MS on average have more disability, and they created this metric age-related MS severity, and you can see it's a huge outlier. It is this locus correlated with severity. And the first thing that's really interesting about this study is where the genes that are linked to severity actually are. First, we'll look at this study looking at genes associated with MS susceptibility. And you can see, colored blue, they almost all have to do with the immune system. And this is really strong evidence that MS is primarily an immune-mediated disease. There's something dysfunctional about the immune system that makes it direct towards self-antigen. However, when you look at genes associated with MS severity, they tend to be within the central nervous system. It's like, okay, you have an abnormal immune system that causes you to have MS, but it's something about your remyelination potential, your integrity of the blood-brain barrier, the integrity of the individual cells, the neurons or astrocytes, or something else that associates with the severity of MS. And you can see the effect is a lot different than MS susceptibility. So MS severity is definitely a lot less genetic than MS susceptibility, but the fact that it's concentrated, at least the genetic load that gives you worse MS, that it's concentrated in the central nervous system is very interesting, and it means there's something important about the brain and meninges and the blood-brain barrier and other factors itself, not just the function of the immune system. And keep that in mind when we take a closer look at this allele. So again, the RS 10191329 allele of the gene I mentioned is associated with a 10% greater risk of confirmed disability progression. This means someone gets worse and they're examined six months later and they're still worse. So it wasn't just random fluctuation. So 10% greater risk, not a huge risk, but it was statistically significant. As I mentioned, 3.7 years shorter time to EDSS 6.0. In other words, 22% greater risk of needing a cane, hazard ratio 1.22, highly statistically significant. This graph shows the EDSS of all the participants. You can see people with labeled A or without the allele. So people either have two copies of the allele A slash A. You can see the purple line. They have a greater accumulation of disability than people who are either heterozygous. They have one copy or they have no copy. So you can see there really isn't a significant difference between having no copies or one copy. It's really having two copies of the allele. Another thing you can see is that genotype is rare. Only 205 participants compared to 2,304 who were heterozygous and 5,626 who had no copies. But you can see the separation there and the lines and confidence intervals look very smooth, again, because of the large sample size. You can see P equals 0 0.0017. Not a big difference, but highly statistically significant. Here you can look at the probability of disability worsening. Again, A slash A, the homozygotes of this allele, the purple line, have the greatest probability of disability worsening, although the hazard ratio, again, 1.1, only 10% greater absolute risk over a long period, more than 10 years. And this is the probability of reaching EDSS6, in other words, needing a cane to walk significant differences. And again, the highest probability with the purple line, which is being homozygous for this allele. Now, I want to mention one other gene, even though it didn't quite reach GWAS statistical significance because it was very close and may actually have a little bit greater clinical significance. This is RS1490971780. This is an allele between two genes. It's in an intron, a non-coding 
area of DNA. It's between the DNM3 gene and the PIGC gene. Even though it's non-coding, introns can sometimes affect splicing or affect expression of genes, affect binding of different proteins that affect gene expression. And it had an association with faster 24-week or six-month confirmed disability progression. And the hazard ratio was actually 1.29, so 29% greater risk, the p-value 0.037, and a shorter time to EDSS6 needing a cane with a hazard ratio of 1.56, 56% greater risk, and this corresponds with an average 3.3 year shorter time to reach EDSS 6.0. But note that this was not statistically significant using Bonferroni correction. This is correction for multiple analyses. Of course, these p-values are less than 0.05, but if true, this would be clinically significant, I believe. And you can see the cumulative probability of worsening disability in people who carry this gene. You can see it's a relatively rare allele, only 166 people in the whole study, which is why it was hard to reach statistical significance. But you can see the yellow line, a greater risk of disability worsening. Same thing if you look at ED ESS 6.0 needing a cane, you can see the yellow line moves a little bit higher. And now we'll go back to the other allele, the RS1019-1329 allele that did reach GWAS significance that was in the title of the article. They also found a few interesting things looking at pathology studies. People with this allele had 1.83 fold, almost twice as many brainstem lesions, such as this region in the pons shown here. They also noted that these lesions tend to be associated with significant axonal loss or damage to the underlying nerve fibers. They also noted 1.76 fold more cortical lesions on the surface of the brain. These are small lesions often difficult to see on conventional MRI. And this gene, as I alluded to, doesn't seem to have effects in the immune system, but is definitely in the nervous system. One thing I should note is it's not close in the genome. In other words, it's not linked to any of the major genes involved in MS susceptibility variants. And by the way, this study, which I didn't show the data here, also recapitulates the idea that there's no association with these genes with MS susceptibility. So what does it do? Well, it appears to affect methylation of the DYSF promoter region. So methylation or adding a methyl group to DNA tends to silence the expression of that gene, tends to cause the DNA, the chromosome to coil up tightly. So the enzymes that would cause transcription of the genes can't get there, so it tends to silence the gene. And this was seen in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, one area of the brain involved in thinking and personality. It also affects the gene ZNF638, the upstream expression of the gene. Both of these genes, DYSF and ZNF638, are expressed in both glial cells, or supportive cells of the nervous system, and neurons themselves. DYSF SF is involved in membrane repair, and ZNF638 is involved in silencing viral DNA. This is interesting because one theory about MS is part of the etiology could be the effect of endogenous retroviruses. Uh, the famous professor Gavin Giovannoni has mentioned this as a possible theory. What about the other allele, RS1490971178? Again, the allele that's in the intronic space between these two genes. So DNM3 is expressed in OPCs, oligodendrocyte precursor cells. These are the cells that can turn into oligodendrocytes, the cells that make myelin in the central nervous system. The gene also affects excitatory synaptic transmissions, neurons stimulating other neurons. It's also involved in synaptic vessel endocytosis, bringing back neurotransmitters into the cell. The other gene, PIGC, is involved in the synthesis of the glycosyl 
phosphatidylinositol anchor. This is part of the cell membrane that anchors proteins to the surface of the membrane. Now they did attempt to look at these genes in other populations. They studied African Americans, only sample size of 1407, and Hispanics, only a sample size of 1708, but they were not able to show any statistically significant association between RS1019-1329 and MS severity or any other gene. With a small effect size, these are actually small sample sizes. And in the paper, the authors did look at various other correlations. One type of study they did is called a Mendelian randomization study. The idea is that, say, if you look at something like smoking, there are a lot of confounders. Smokers are different from non-smokers in ways other than smokers. But if you look at the genes that are associated with smoking, you take away some of that bias, or the genes associated with vitamin D levels. So one thing they looked at is the genes associated with educational attainment. And you can see this very clear association between percentile in years of education, again, based on genetic correlations, and the average age-related multiple sclerosis severity score. Almost a difference in EDSS1 between least education and most education. It's not a huge difference, but there does seem to be a linear association. So maybe there's something about being more well-educated that's somehow beneficial in people with MS. Now, at the end of the day, the question is, can we predict how severe someone's multiple sclerosis is likely to be by looking at their genes? And the authors of this paper attempted to look at all the genes together and create a genetic susceptibility score to greater disability with MS, and you can see the results here. They compared the people with the highest quartile, the greatest susceptibility to severe MS based on genetics, versus the lowest quartile in blue, and you can see their probability of reaching ED ESS6, needing a cane, is approximately the same minor non-statistically significant difference between the highest quartile and the lowest quartile. So despite some of the results in a few outlier genes, really overall this study confirms what we already knew, which is the severity of MS simply is not strongly genetic. Now of course it would be very interested to look at those genes. Maybe we could even identify future drug targets that focus on the central nervous system and not the immune system system, but really we can't predict how severe someone's MS is going to be because it's simply not genetic. And if you think about it, a hazard ratio of 1.1, 10% greater risk of disability progression, this is very small. Numbers like 3.7 year greater tendency or shorter time to reach EDSS 6 sounds like a lot, but in the real world, the natural variation is between needing a cane right at the time of diagnosis or not needing a cane 50 years later. So just the natural variation is absolutely massive. And I personally think this is good news because it means most of the variation in the severity of MS may be environmental. Maybe we can alter it with diet, with lifestyle, with sunlight exposure, vitamin supplementation, psychology, and disease-modifying therapy. I'd be interested to know your thoughts. Do you think this is good news or bad news? I do give the researchers a lot of credit for doing this incredibly complex study and really correlating different sources of information, both the genes and data on disability, and really closing the door on this topic, we most likely will never find any gene that has any significant risk on multiple sclerosis severity, even though susceptibility to getting MS in the first place is definitely to some extent genetic. Let me know what you think and do you have suggestions for other videos?